I am not supposed to be here. I am supposed to be living on my family's compound in West Virginia, serving my husband and raising children. But instead, I spend my days disrupting the familiar, a skill I learned as a child, questioning the wealth disparities between my two sets of grandparents. My dad told me that if you work hard, your ascendancy has no limits. Yet I could not reconcile why my paternal grandfather consistently worked two to three jobs just to survive, while my maternal grandfather lived a life of leisure. When I challenged my father's sage advice, he told me there was more to the story. Well, what is it? I asked. Dad explained that my maternal grandfather was in retirement. I, the ever inquisitive child, asked, when will Grandpa Williams get to retire? The answer was never. He didn't have a job that offered benefits, especially not health insurance, which ultimately meant he would die early. Cause of death? Heart failure. But as a sociologist, I would argue that his cause of death was poverty. As a first generation college student, I entered my freshman year deferring to authority, a result of my blue collar upbringing. However, my professors taught me that I had a voice and lived experiences that had merit and deserved recognition. Yet, when I revealed in a doctoral seminar that I hail from teen parents, the professor stated, you aren't supposed to be here, are you? Although I knew what she meant, statistically speaking, I was an anomaly. The message was loud and clear. I did not belong in a doctoral program. According to a 2018 study, 26% of first-generation students enroll in public four-year universities as I had done. Further, the rate at which first-generation college students go on to doctoral programs is only half that of college graduates whose parents had earned college degrees. So what does this tell us? First, it tells us that my professor was right. But it also tells us that social inequalities are perpetuated as a result of exclusion, exclusion from spaces that lead to advancement. Since I can remember, I've heard about the American dream, this insistence that all you need are bootstraps to tug on. But recognizing that the vast majority of would-be first-generation college students are not pursuing higher education tells me one thing. The American dream will likely remain a dream for many, while it is a birthright for others. Let's face it, we live in a credentialed society, meaning that college degrees are increasingly necessary to obtain a good job. So you may be asking yourself, okay, but how many people are we really talking about here? In 2019, a report on parental education shows that only 38% of fathers and 36% of mothers have at least a bachelor's degree. Thus, only a little more than one-third of children in the U.S. have college-educated parents. Yet, these are the same students who are most likely to be enrolled in four-year universities, and they are also the most likely to graduate. So what is holding first-generation college students back? We know there are contributing factors, such as unequal access to quality education, but there is also something else, a sense of belonging. In his book, Limbo, Lubrano refers to people who transition from blue-color backgrounds into white-color worlds as straddlers. He argues that straddlers are at home in neither world, living a limbo life. It's the part of the American dream you may have never heard about. The cost of social mobility people pay with their anxiety about their place in life. It's a discomfort many never overcome. Indeed, I would argue there is a paradox of education. Education provides security in a credentialed world, but it can create tenuity in familial relationships where people are rooted, meaning that education allows people to advance professionally, while at the same time it means they may be creating divisions between themselves and their families. So many people may be asking if education is worth the risk. As a college student, I was always hyper aware of my first generation status. I occupied a liminal space, a betweenness, that meant that I was not simply a consumer of the information being taught, but often I had firsthand knowledge of the lived experiences we were learning about. I recognized this liminality when professors assigned evidence-based books that read more like my family history than ethnographies meant to spread awareness or to inform policy. 
The experiences featured in these books resonated with me as they were struggles my family faced each day. Teenage pregnancy, multi-generational households, relationship churning, and of course, material deprivation. For many of my peers, these books served as introductions to layers of disadvantage, but to me, participants' descriptions and pseudonyms could easily be replaced with faces and names that were near and dear to me. Did this mean I belonged more at home, or could I offer an insider's perspective, and would that perspective be beneficial in the classroom? I felt like an outsider within. I was an outsider within, but I didn't give up. As a professor, I view my liminality as an asset, a tool to help students learn sociology. Indeed, I make myself vulnerable to students by using my own stories. My parents are divorced. I'm a member of the LGBTQ plus community. I do this as a mechanism of inclusion. Sharing my own lived experiences encourages students to also open up, especially those students who have never felt empowered. But what's the point, right? What is the point? By discussing diverse experiences, students begin to understand that social constructions are just that. These are categories that we have created to allow us to easily order society. Us versus them, black versus white, old versus young. And once we begin to expose diverse experiences, students quickly learn that their lived experiences are not necessarily universal, but they're also not necessarily unique meaning that the divisions we have constructed in society begin to break down as they learn more and more about each other. So in other words, much of what they think as normal or abnormal has simply just been defined as such. As an example, about midway through one semester, I was giving a lecture on sexuality when a student stated that he did not like gay people. They were all the same, right? All trying to force their sexuality on others. He had never spent time around gay people, and he wanted to keep it that way. After his declaration, one student turned to him and said, I am gay, which ignited a chain reaction. Student after student revealed that they were gay. He was flummoxed. And then I turned to him and said, I am gay. See, that's the thing about stereotypes. They allow us to only narrowly examine social phenomenon, and they also limit our social relationships. Because no one in that classroom had performed and presented in ways that were consistent with gay stereotypes, he felt like he could share his bigoted remarks or his bigoted ideologies because he felt that his bigoted ide ideologies were universal in that classroom. But how often do we hear this refrain? I am friends with this person because they aren't like other gay people or they aren't like other poor people. People we know aren't like others because we've spent time with them, and that time has humanized them. They are not simply their stereotype. The student recognized that we are much more alike than we are different. About a year later, I ran into him in a coffee shop, and he told me that he was applying to graduate programs in philosophy because my class had changed his worldview. In truth, all my class had done was expose him to diverse people. But it did make me wonder how many people do impression management each day as a way to hide parts of their identities. And how many of the same people are forced to tolerate bigoted remarks without a champion, without an advocate, without somebody willing to expose difference. Exposure leads to understanding and empathy, and empathy leads to inclusion. Education not only taught me how to academically explore social phenomena, but it has bestowed on me the responsibility to centralize all voices, not simply those that are hegemonic. My job is to reveal the harsh realities of our social world, and I do so by requiring students to read about and discuss things like racial, gender, and economic disparities that permeate our country. My grandmother always tells me it would be a dull world if we were all alike, and I agree. Therefore, I push my students to recognize that not everyone has access to their life, to a middle-class life, to food, to a consistent address. But my approaches to teaching are not about promoting guilt. My approaches lend themselves to social acceptance, awareness, and community. My hope is that students leave my classes inspired to challenge others to think 
beyond stereotypes, to continue to have these difficult conversations, to point out when somebody is promoting inequality, and to use statistics to stop the bigotry. I prepare my students to be sociologists in action, to promote equity and inclusion, because who knows, maybe the phrase, you aren't supposed to be here, will one day become obsolete.